sociology optional, right? So this is what we are going to discuss. Before I start, before I do anything, I would like to talk about a few myths. The myths which exist. Number one, sociology is a theoretical subject. Very dry, academic. Number two, One has to remember a lot of names, names of thinkers, number three, you have to mug a lot. You have to remember a lot. Number four, paper two is extremely dynamic. Point number one, do you realize this point and this point, they contradict each other? If something is really dynamic, you cannot mug it. And if something you're supposed to mug, it cannot be dynamic. Right? I'll come to this, these myths later on. Not right now. See, if you ask me how is sociology as an optional, obviously I'll be having a bias. Right? I love this subject. I studied this subject. Not only for UPSC, even for academic purpose, I, I studied this subject. Right. So given all that thing, given that love, that affection that I have towards sociology, I would be biased. And this would be the case of every faculty teaching any optional subject. So if you ask me whether sociology is a good optional or not, it's a very wrong question to ask to a wrong person. Right? That's the reality here. Now the question is then, how is sociology? How to understand what kind of an optional is this? I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to use some data given to us by UPSC. May I? Ask Rakesh, uh, some of the projector is not working properly. I want to show you, I would love, love to show you the annual report of UPSC. Every year UPSC comes up with the annual report. This is one of the annual reports. Uh, this is the 71st annual report 2020-21, which UPSC came out with. Rakesh, but they can't hear screen catching somehow. The screen is different, but just take it out. Still the same thing. So like, uh, let, let me try something else. Internet catch for It's not even getting that as well. No, it's just stuck in the home screen. Anyway, take out your phones. Let's not uh, look at the board, just take out your phones. You must be having some browser, right? Go to the browser.
type 71st annual report of UPSC. 71st annual report of UPSC. 2020-2021. Okay. Then PDF, write PDF and search it. I was having the PDF, I, that's what I wanted to show you. Actually, not only that PDF, uh, I, I was supposed to show you a lot of other things as well. That's why I needed the question to work properly. Anyway, have you got a PDF? 2020-2021, 71st annual report. Okay, I wish you've got it. Okay, I'll just, uh, okay, I'll just do that. It's completely switched off. Oh, wait a minute. Switch my switch on. Mm -hmm. What? That's what I, I was trying to do. Even that's not working properly. Yep. Even then. Yep. I duplicated it. Let me try. So do hey, but, uh, can just It's not even taking the display. This is the one. No, my God. Okay. Got it. Finally. Okay. Yep. It's okay. That will be. I'm going to uh, page number. Eighty-six. What is this? All the optional subjects with which students in the year 2020-2021, they appeared in civil services examination. I'm looking at the number of students who appeared and at the same point of time, I'm also looking at number of students who qualified. Okay. Show me two optionals with which more than 1,000 students, they appeared and 10% is the selection rate. There's one more. Mm, not political science, it's anthropology. Close to 10%, right? So this is where it stands. Look at political science, 8.2 percent. Guys, 
if one candidate with one particular optional gets selection, I'm not going to give the subject any credit. Why? Maybe that particular student, that particular one guy, was really good at the subject. So he took the subject, he or she took the subject, handled it properly, secured selection. But if 1,000 plus students, they're taking a subject, and 10% around, they are securing their selection, I have to admit, that means the subject is helping somewhere. Look at the whole record. And this is not my record. From the very beginning. Agriculture, how many students? 124. Animal husbandry, how many students? 16. Can I consider these subjects? 3 out of 16. No, I can't. Those three candidates who secured the selection, I'm going to give the credit to those individual students, not to the subject. But show me those subjects with which more than 1,000 students that took those subjects and 10% around they secured their selection. Anthropology? What is the percentage in geography? 5.5%. Is it 10% around? Even with law, see, 186. Huh? With management, 54. The, practically, the only subject with 1,000 plus students ensuring 10% selection, that's sociology. That's why I said I do not know. If you ask me whether sociology as an optional is good or bad, I'm the worst person to ask this question. I'm a very wrong person to ask this question because obviously I'm going to have bias. Let's look at some report which is credible. I think this report can be called credible. Right? Now let me come back to those myths that I mentioned in the very beginning. Sociology is a theoretical subject. Which subject is not? Right? In GS, I ordinarily teach international relations. International relations and Indian society. These are the two subjects I teach. International relations, is it not theoretical? Extremely theoretical. Any subject, if you have to understand the subject properly, you have to understand from where the developments are coming. Whatever is happening today, how is it happening and why is it happening? COVID, right? What can be more dynamic than that example? Let's use that example only. What was COVID? What is COVID? One particular strain of coronavirus, right? That's why we used to call it novel coronavirus or COVID-19. That was the name that was given to that particular virus. How did we found the vaccine to that virus so easily, so fast? Any answer? Coronavirus has always been there. It's nothing new. There are more than six lakh viruses in the environment. Problem is, they can't jump the gene. They can't ordinarily affect us human beings. This particular virus could. But since coronavirus is always there and they ordinarily infect the animals, our pets and everyone, a number of you, you might be having dogs in your home, right? Dogs and bovines, cattle, they can get affected by coronavirus. So there was a vaccine for them, not for us. Since there was a vaccine for them, within one or one and a half years, we could prepare, one year actually, we could prepare a vaccine for ourselves as well. Because the basic strain was there, na? The basic strain for the, the vaccine was there. The basic uh, research was there. So what happened? The theory. Theory of the basic research helped the advanced study. 
you go for any advanced study, you have to go for theory. And then again, sociology being theoretical, okay. Do you know you all know the subject very well? Yeah, as a teacher, my job would not be to teach you. We'll use an example today in the class. I'll take one topic to help you understand what the subject is. And then only you'll tell me whether it's theoretical or not. So I'm leaving this myth for the typing. Chalo. Let's leave it. Let's talk about a second myth that I wrote on the board. You have to remember a lot of names, names of thinkers, names of people who studied. Okay. Have you ever heard the name of Mr. M.K. Gandhi? You remember that name? How come? From the moment we opened our eyes, we are seeing the photograph of that person. On the notes, first and foremost. Then in some house as well, we do have photos of Mr. M.K. Gandhi. Right? So we know who Mr. M.K. Gandhi is. Have you ever heard of Dr. B.R. Ambedkar? Do you know they are the thinkers of sociology in paper too? You'll have to study them. Will it be very difficult to remember these names? Clear? Will it be very difficult to remember the name of Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru? No, right? There are other thinkers as well. But the way we have learned about Mr. M.K. Gandhi, about Dr. B.R. Ambedkar, about Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, in a similar way, in the class, we'll be again and again using those five, six people. Some eight, nine people actually. Again and again using their studies, what they have talked about, what they discussed. Right? So please don't try to mug. I'm just going to say something completely opposite to the myth. In sociology, please do not mug. If you mug it, you'll never be able to write answers. UPSC will be twisting and turning the questions. Right? They'll never give questions uh, which are already there. They would never repeat questions in that sense. They would always be twisting and turning the questions. The moment they twist and turn the question, the nature of the answer gets changed. You can only handle the question or the answer properly, and this is true with every optional. You can only handle the answer properly if you have understood the concepts, especially in sociology. Do not mug. You're having any problem in understanding? Ask me. Ask me again and again. Today in the morning only, uh, one GS class was uh, taking place uh, of international relations where I was talking about uh, this thing. We ordinarily hesitate. Uh, I'm looking at one student who's uh, from the previous batches, from the last year's batch. Normally, uh, uh, you, you two already know me how I teach, right? If you ask me, I would be looking forward to your questions. Your questions would be the one which will be fueling my study, which will be pushing me forward. That's the truth. So please never hesitate from asking any question in my class. And don't think whether your question is a foolish question or not. Please allow me, let me to judge whether it's a foolish question or not. Clear? But one thing for sure, please do not try to mug. This is not a subject which can be handled by mugging. Clear? This is social science. It's not literature. In literature, still people do mug. But in social science, use your logic, use your rationality and understand things. Clear? Now I'm coming to the last myth. Paper 2 is extremely dynamic. That's not a, not a bad thing, actually. Do you know that? The same current affairs you'll have to study for GS is going to be used here. 
can you ignore current affairs for GS mains? Indian society, there is a section of Indian society in GS mains paper one. Can you ignore the current affairs in that particular section? The same current affairs is going to be used here. So is that a bad thing? And what is extremely dynamic? What's the meaning of that extremely dynamic thing? Nothing can be extremely dynamic. There, can, there has to be a balance. A balance between the theoretical understanding, theoretical part, and at the same point of time, the dynamic part, the current affairs. The current affairs events, they actually help us get the examples. In the class, you'll never find me using any bookish example. I'm giving you one uh, 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 very simple understanding here. Say for example, economics, you've heard of this subject. The father of modern economics, a person called Adam Smith. He, while discussing demand, there is a concept called demand in economics, right? He, while talking about demand, he gave an example that if, if you leave a man in desert, the man is roaming around in desert and he is thirsty, he or she is thirsty. You give the person a handful of diamonds, that diamond will be useless to that person because the person needs water. This example was given by Adam Smith 400 years back. We are still using that example. Right? On the contrary, if I have to talk about the examples here in India, right? If I have to talk about women's empowerment, say for example, I would always be talking about, say the recent events, uh, say uh, Shani Singhapur temple entry movement. I'll be talking about instant triple talaq, banning of instant triple talaq, right? I'll be talking about how I'm looking at increase in literacy rate among women in India. I'll be using those examples. So please do not use those bookish examples. Look, look at around you and you'll get examples from there. Use them. They'll be more relevant to your discussion, to your answers than the bookish ones. So is that so difficult? Literacy rate among women in India. How often does it change? Once in 10 years. Na? Census report. And the problem is we are still using the census report of 2011. We do not have the recent data because the recent study has not taken place. So is current affairs really so dynamic? I don't know. When did the issue of instant triple talaq came into news? 2018, 2019, right? Four, five years back. Is it really so dynamic? Whether for GS or for sociology. Okay, yeah? so that's how things are. Okay, now I'm coming to the first myth. It's extremely theoretical. It's so difficult to understand. I'm going to use one particular example here, right? I'm, I'm going to take up one, one topic called family. And I'll try to understand this particular topic in the class. If I talk about family system here in India today, what I'm seeing, previously there used to be a particular family system called joint family system. Ever heard of this? Those among you who belong to the uh, Red Bees or Kamma caste, right? Was extremely prevalent among you. You've seen my name as well, Bose, right? A typical Kshatriya from Northern India, landed aristocracy. Even among us, the same thing was there. Any part of India, where you're looking at the landed people, the people who, who were the landowners, 
you will always find a joint family system among them. Whether it be the Reddis and Kammas in Andhra, Andhra and Telangana, or Boos in Bengal, or Singh in Bihar, West Bengal, uh, Bihar, uh, UP, Rajasthan, right? So I'm looking at those people. Roy are Brahmins. Brahmins. Okay. And Brahmins in West Bengal, either they were uh, socially backward, pushed aside because uh, you can understand the Kshatriyas has been dominating. They have been dominating. Subhashundra Bose, Jyoti Basu, Rashbiari Bose, Isin Bose. Right? Who's Isin Bose? Satyananda Bose? Who's he? Bose-Einstein theory. Boson particles. Higgs boson particle. Right? So, I'm looking at things in that sense. Clear? So, joint family system. Is it really so alien to you? Have you never heard of it? But today, as things go by, what I'm looking at, with globalization, jobs are becoming available at distant corners of the country. Right? Say, for example, today you're in Hyderabad. In civil services, jobs have always been extremely mobile. Right. Anyway, let, let me elaborate this thing. Say, today you're here in Hyderabad. You get your selection. Maybe you get Assam cadre. Can you control the selection of your cadre? Can anyone here control the selection of the cadre? No. If you get... Assam cadre, are you going to carry every member of your family with you? Your father, your mother, uh, your wife and your husband, or uh, your uh, kids, your uncle, aunties, your cousin brothers, cousin sisters, everyone with you to Assam. Are they going to go with you? So the moment jobs become mobile, what happens? People, they have to break out of the family, of the joint family split in the family. We talk about breaking of the joint family system. And I'm looking at rise of what? Nuclear families. I'm also looking at something called single person household. I myself, I used to live in uh, su such kind of a system. How? Say a person, say when uh, say me in Delhi, let me give you the example of me myself in Delhi. I left hostel a long time back. After that, got, got a job, was teaching somewhere, then uh, into the field of civil service as well. So I was earning quite handsomely. What I did, I rented a small flat for myself. I was living in that flat. How many members were there? Me only. Just me. Can that household, can, can it be called a nuclear family? I was not married at that point of time. So what was that? A single person household. This way is rising. Are these things so difficult to understand? Did you know about these two things? You know, let's talk about marriage. We talked about family, gave a brief example of family. Let's talk about marriage. Previously, the only form of marriage that was prevalent across India was arranged marriage. People hardly ever had any, anything to say. Any, any person, any individual hardly had any say over their own marriage. It was decided by the family. Today, what am I looking at? Rise of love marriage. And not only that, I'm also looking at live-in relationships. Clear? Guys, one more thing. Sociology is like doing post-mortem. Have you ever been into morgue? No, right? 
Anyone who's a doctor here in the class? No one is a doctor. Good. Then there is no reason for you to unnecessarily go to morgue. Let's come back. The way the doctors, uh, while studying, uh, they, they do, they, 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 they just dissect the bodies, right? Or say, whenever an, uh, some, some untoward incident happens and a person loses his or her life, normally the body is taken for post-mortem. The body is dissected and uh, they try to find out medically why the person died, what led to the death of the person, right? Sociology is typically that kind of a subject. We make the society lay down in front of us and we dissect various body parts of the society. Okay. Not all the body parts of the society are nice. They can't be. Some of the body parts of the society start rottening. We also dissect that, we see that. Right? Some of the parts, they might be changing. So we look at all of these things. So in the class, I'll be taking up a number of things which you may not find nice. Say for example, when I'll be talking about the condition of caste system as it was prevalent in India, right? I'll be going in depth and believe me, we were not human beings. We were genuinely not human beings. Especially the so-called upper caste people, right? Where even I do admit that my predecessors, they also belong to that caste category. You have no idea what kind of tortures they have been doing. Here in the class, I'm not unraveling all the aspects. So number of things I'll be taking up, which may not seem to be nice but we'll have to study them. We have to know those things. Clear? So, that too we'll be looking at. Now, I was uh, giving example of uh, marriage. That's why uh, this thing came up, because uh, the moment uh, I talked about a uh, live-in relationship, I realized some of you might not be comfortable completely. Those things are happening in the society. And we are here to study the society. First of all, forget whether you, you are a, from, from which particular society or which particular section you come from. All your identities should be outside the class. Here you are just a student and you are supposed to study the society. So see what's going on there. If you talk about live-in relationship, are you going to tell me this is something new to the society? This has never been there. I'm looking at one book which was written around 300 CE. Common Era. Previously we used to write AD. Now not AD anymore. 300 CE. Gupta Era. Gupta Dynasty. They were ruling India at the point of time. Gupta Empire. A book was written called Manu Smriti. In that book, Manu Smriti, I'm looking at Eight types of Hindu marriage systems. Out of those eight types of Hindu marriage systems, I'm looking at the fifth type called Gandharva Viva. What is Gandharva Viva? The man and the woman agree that yes, they are going to get into a relationship and they start living together. It's their decision. And no one has any right to question that. That's Gandharva Viva. So are you going to really tell me that a uh, living relationship is something which never existed in India previously? Then how is it there in the scripture? Clear? So, yes, the moment we start studying and see what happened. While discussing marriage, I actually went in depth. The moment I started taking up... Uh, Manusmriti and all these things, I was going in depth. Now, are these things so extremely alien to you? That's why I say that you know about sociology. 
Why? Because you are born and brought up in a society. You know your society properly. My job here is to give a direction to your understanding. High chances you have only studied or you have only looked at the society here in among the Telugu people, Andhra or Telangana. The moment I'll start talking about the Nayas of Kerala, you'll find it alien. The moment I'll start talking about Todas of Nilgiri, you'll find it alien. In Mahabharata, we have heard about Draupadi being married to five brothers. That was nothing unique. Believe me. Why? I'm looking at Todas of Nilgiri. Toda people, they are cattle herders. It's very difficult for them to maintain a family. So what they do, say there are three or four brothers. Together, these three or four brothers, they would be marrying one woman. What happens? All the brothers together, they will manage the resources and they'll be feeding and maintaining that woman and her kids. And this is also a very effective way of maintaining the population balance. How come? There can be three brothers, four brothers, doesn't matter. But the woman can be pregnant only as many number of times. You cannot make her doubly pregnant, right? Not possible. So this way, this is also a very effective tool of population balance, maintaining population balance. And the Todas, they knew that they have a very restrictive area where they can herd their cattle. They can take their cattle too for grazing. So they had to maintain the population as well. And this is what they were doing. And not only the Todas were doing this. I'm looking at another community in India, this time in northern India. Again, a hilly region. Khasa. There is a community called Khasa community. Not Khasi. Khasis are from Meghalaya. This is Khasa. Khasas of Johnsal Bawar region, this is Uttarakhand. Don't have to note them down, we'll have to study all of them again. They have given you the syllabus, right? Take out the syllabus, go to paper 2, look at family. May I have one copy of the syllabus, please? Just one. Look at section B of paper 2 and in section B go for subtopic 5, systems of kinship in India. This one ma'am. Systems of kinship in India. They will have to study these things. Clear? So this is what we are going to study. That okay, till now you have looked at only the Telugu society. There are things beyond Telugu society as well. Let's look at Todas, let's look at Khasas. That's how we are going to compare. But is it so difficult? But then this is sociology. I was talking about Nayas of Kerala. I am looking at one of the few systems where women had some say at least over property. Women across India, they were treated as objects. Sorry. They have hardly been ever considered to be human beings. And here, please don't tell me about Hindus or uh, any such section. No, I'm talking about across India. Hindus, Muslims, Sikh, Christian, throughout. Condition of woman has been extremely pathetic. Muslims may say that, okay, women, they, they always had right to inheritance. How much? Only half as much as that of the brothers. So the father had 100 rupees. Now, no one has 100 rupees as a property, but just for an example. So the father had 100 rupees. 
out of this 10 rupees will go for work of right remaining 90 rupees say there is one brother and one sister the brother will get 60 rupees the sister will get 30 rupees so there are two brothers and one sister the brothers will get 36 rupees each the sister will get 18 rupees so even among the muslims i do not see women enjoying equal status for the sikh buddhists christians situation has been as it is among the hindus so now tell me Yeah. So again, I'm going to look at all these sections. So please, no Hindu Muslim here in the class. I can't handle that. Because I'm going to look at all these sections and if you ask me, things have been equal among all these sections. Right? So, this is what sociology is all about. Now, question is, how does this subject help us? Why? Why sociology can secure this percentage? Two, three reasons. Number one, since we all are born and brought up in the society only, in Indian society only, and that's primarily going to be our subject matter of study right so we all know something or the other from our real life experiences we know what's going on we know what has been happening okay at the same point of time it becomes really easier for us to understand what's happening in the in the other sections maybe where uh, say the way i was giving example of todas khasas or nayas right it becomes easier for us because we know about them. How many of you never heard the Naya term? Can anyone raise the, raise the hand that I have never heard the uh, Naya surname before, ever before? You all have heard, heard the surname Naya before. So I was talking about those Nayas here. Clear? So this way, it becomes really easy to understand the things, the concepts, right? So do you really find it extremely theoretical? That, that's one aspect. Number two, if you understand the concepts properly, the way, say, I discussed family, the way I discussed marriage here in the class, if you can understand these things properly, which are very simple concepts, you can write on your own. And that's the bigger aspect here. If you can write on your own, you will be securing marks. Yes, there would be a technique of writing. Say in the class, I was continuously giving you data. Why do you think I used uh, the time frame and then gave you the name of the book as well? While writing the answer, I have to use this data. Okay, I'm saying this, but I'm saying this from Manusmriti. I'm saying this and I'm saying this from the census report. If I'm talking about the woman literacy rate, I'm quoting this from the census report. You have to substantiate yourself continuously. There are these few tricks. If we can maintain that, there's no reason for us not to get marks. And then again, these techniques are also to be used in GS. Not only in sociology. Clear? And then, sociology also helps us in GS and in essay, which we don't understand. Say in GS, we continuously we look at uh, this, uh, what to say? This, this section called Indian society, which is nothing but an extraction from sociology, paper two of sociology. All those things you have to study here in sociology. 
please, that, that does not mean that if you're taking sociology as an optional, you will be skipping that class of GS. No. Be there as well, be present there as well, because if you're doing it here, if you're doing GS here, I will be taking up questions, questions of GS in that class to discuss. Achha, one more thing, if you're studying with me, today you have been given only the syllabus. When the class starts, you'll, be, you'll also be given the last five years question papers. Keep them handy with you. How do you know that whatever I'm teaching here in the class is actually what is required? Do you know the syllabus? No, you don't. But UPSC knows. So after every topic, we will be taking up the previous year's questions and we'll try to write their answers. Until and unless you write, your preparation is not complete, guys. So, extremely integral with the preparation process is the writing process. I was saying now that uh, if you can write on your own, nothing good like that. No, none of us were born by knowing how to write. Anyone, any great scholar here in the class who can claim that, okay, the day I was born, I was writing a poetry. Anyone? No one can be. If you go and meet Ravina Tagore, not possible. His day, the long day to meet him, you'll have to go to somewhere else. Even he can't claim that uh, he, he, he was born and he was writing poetry immediately. No one can do that. Writing is an art which has to be developed. And we will, we will be doing that here in the class. So don't think it's all about study. No. At the same point of time, it's also about writing. Right? So, that's how things are. So, this is how sociology also helps in GS. But, more than GS, I would like to look at AC. Normally, I say this and uh, we laugh at it. I do say that if you're very unlucky, you'll get at least one topic of AC common from your sociology syllabus. And if you are moderate kind of a person, neither very lucky nor very unlucky, you'll get both the topics from sociology. Let's see. I'm going to look at four years essay papers. 2022, the last. 2021, 2020, 2019. I can keep on going, but then I'll be taking the whole amount of time. Let's not do that. So, one by one. 2022. Let's look at the topics. Number one, uh, see, in section A, this year, I, I do have only one topic. Let me be very honest. People this year, they were really unlucky. In section A, this particular topic can be called remotely associated with sociology, but I'm going to ignore that. What I'm looking at is this particular topic. In fact, the, here, the issue was that God knows why we were discussing this particular topic in August around and then when the mains took place we found this mentioned in the essay paper. You cannot step in the same river twice. How come? The water of the river flows, keeps on flowing. We use this metaphor to discuss how society continuously keeps on changing. Change is the only constant in society. As time passes by, situation changes. Two particular situations can, can never be identical. There would be differences in certain parameters. Clear? And the same thing happens in the river. The water keeps on flowing. So say today, if we go to a river, right, the river will be stepping in, the, the water will be stepping in, that water will flow away. So next time, if tomorrow we go again, that particular set of water would not be there. It has flown away. A new set of water would be there. That's the reality of the society. So the topic was not about the water. The topic was about the changing nature of the society. This is sociology. 
take out your syllabus go to the last topic of paper one social change this is from there similarly i'm looking at this 2021 paper okay your perception of me is a reflection of you how you see me whether you see good in me or you see bad in me it depends on your own mindset your own point of view and your point of view is completely based on your own understanding my reaction to you is an awareness of me how am i going to react to your to to you am i going to react badly if i genuinely hold myself in good esteem something will stop me from behaving really badly i won't feel comfortable to behave really badly that comes from my awareness about myself go to paper 1 to the thinkers see section 4 look at the last thinker mead george herbert mead this is his discussion self and mind it's also mentioned there not only this topic let's look at the other topics chalo hands that rocks the cradle hand that rocks the cradle rules the world what do you mean by rocking the cradle in the childhood days we all used to sleep in a in, in something uh, in in a uh, something uh, a swing right and our mothers used to swing that particular swing right that is rocking the cradle that that particular swing we were laid at that's called cradle and who used to do that our mothers the idea is those who train us those who groom us if they are training us if they are providing us training if they are providing us grooming properly that means that themselves they are really greatly capable immensely capable let me ask you uh, today in the morning only uh, we were talking about this who's the highest paid is officer in india the director of lavasta why why not the cabinet secretary the cabinet secretary is senior most but in terms of uh, those allowances and all the ultimate salary package of the director of labasna is higher why responsibility he or she is the one who grooms the future generation of the officers you look at svp npa sir the vallabha patel national police academy always a highly decorated ips officer would be appointed as director of this particular academy one of the most uh, famous examples k vijay kumar who's k vijay kumar the man who was the first first batch of officers when nsg was formed at the same point of time k vijay kumar was also the head of the stf special task force of tamil nadu and karnataka who finish of the that that menace of virappan that k vijay kumar at first he was posted as a dg uh, of uh, uh, cis uh, crpf and then from dg crpf he became director lavasna a uh, director is vp npm always the highest or or the most decorated officers they are sent there as directors same thing goes with ima dehradun indian military academy dehradun why to groom the future generation you need those people who who themselves are tremendously capable and if they are training us if they are making us able they can do something extraordinary now think of our mothers do you think raising you was a very easy task anyone here do you think you were the nicest of the kid go see yourself in the mirror 
and your mother groomed you. So if she had used her energy in building herself, what she could have had achieved. There's an English saying which says, you educate a man, the man will feed the family. You educate a woman, she'll educate next three generations. I'm looking at that. And that rocks the cradle, rules the world. We talk about Alexander, right? I'm going to talk about Alexander's mother, Olympia. It was the ambitions of Olympia and her machination that Alexander became that. Alexander may not have had even been the emperor. Philip II would have given the crown to someone else. Alexander was never the favorite choice. Then, so many examples like this. Clear? This is sociology. Let's look at uh, some more these kind of things, some more papers actually. Say 2020, AC paper of 2020. Life is long journey between human being and being human. What is a human being? A creature, an animal, homo sapiens, that's a human being. Is that it? Is that what you are? An animal who jumps into the food, starts devouring the food like an animal? No. You're not that. You're made up of values. You're made up of ideas. There comes the idea of being human. Clear? Similarly, I can also use this. Ships do not sink because of water around them. Ships sink because of water that gets into them. Why do you think civilizations fall? What led to the downfall of Indus Valley civilization? What led to the downfall of whichever empire you may talk about? I would be talking about five or six factors. I can't say only one factor. The first and foremost thing that I'll be talking about is deterioration in the value system. The water inside the ship, the values that make us what we are, the values that make us human beings, if that value starts declining. Let's talk about Mauryan Empire. I'm looking at the time of Ashoka. We all have heard, of, heard the name of Ashoka. Let's talk about the edicts of Ashoka, the rock edicts and the pillar edicts, where Ashoka has been talking about his Dhamma. Was he propagating Buddhism by those edicts? Those edicts were about being human. Right? What we should do, how we should do. Right? The aspirations, the rights of the people. For the first time, someone in India talking about rights of the citizen, that's Ashoka. Clear? I'm looking at the last ruler in the Mauryan dynasty, Udain, height of debauchery. The man was just lost to alcohol, womanizer. You can attribute everything to him. What am I looking at? Downfall of the values. And not only the values. At the same point of time, with the downfall of the values, I'm looking at the downfall of the administrative system, the administrative capabilities. So add all of these things together. I'm not dictating all the four or five points which are there, which led to downfall of any particular civilization. But you will always find that the society would start rottening from within. And then only it will cause the downfall of the society. 
you tell me one simple thing. Europeans, the Britishers, a handful of Britishers came to India. How come these handful of Britishers, they enslaved us? How come we, the Indians, such a huge nation, became slaves practically to a handful of Britishers? Numerically, who were they? Where were they standing? Can you tell me? If I look at the society at that point of time, tell me what, what was I looking at? What was the condition of leadership in India? Who were the leaders in India at that point of time? Zamindas? I'm looking at the Mughals first. I'm looking at one particular ruler who was known as Rangila, Muhammad Shah Rangila. What's the meaning of Rangila? Is it a very nice word? This is what was happening. At the same point of time, if I, if I look at India from any particular aspect, say values, people were busy looting at that point of time. Whomsoever could was looting people who were subordinates to them. When the Britishers came, they were looking at a society which was deteriorating from within. And the ship started sinking. See? Have you ever heard the name Raja Ram Mohan Roy? What was his primary area of work? No. Woman's literacy. Raja Ram Mohan Roy, David Hare, these were the people who, who, were the, who were spearheading the idea of women's literacy. Why? This question was haunting Raja Ram Mohan Roy. We call him the first modern man in India, right? Now, don't we think that being modern means being wearing jeans and all that? Show me one photograph of Raja Ram Mohan Roy wearing jeans. Right. Modernity is about ideas. Rationality, scientific thinking, that's modernity. Okay, now when I look at Raja Ram Mohan Roy, what do I see? I see I see that frustration. It was genuinely haunting him that how could a handful of Europeans come and they could capture us. Do you know what his idea was? His idea was that who actually helps us grow? Our mothers. And look at the condition here in India. We have pushed our mothers, women in the society, to the corner. Ninety-nine percent women during that time they were illiterate. So what is this? These are the factors, the water inside the ship, which caused the sinking of the ship. And he started working in that respect. So is this topic from anything else? No, I'm looking at the society. But problem is, both of them, whether this one or this one, they are in the same section, right? So let's look at the next section. Culture is what we are. Civilization is what we have. Again, sociology. Go to paper two.
Look at the thinkers. The first thinker you'll be looking at is G.S. Ghure, Indology. He's the one talking about this. Culture and civilization in India. So this year, practically, I have three topics from sociology. Now, let me look at 2019. Values are not what humanity is, but what humanity ought to be. I'm not going to elaborate this topic. Just do one thing. Go to paper one. Go to section two. The second topic in paper one. You can find fact, value, and objectivity. I'm looking at the number two, second, uh, number three, uh, the topic number three. Based for an individual is not necessarily based for the society. Individual interest, societal interest may not always be the same. Say there is a ruler and the ruler aspires to cling to power and to cling to power, to hold on to power, the ruler can do anything. That's what his or her intentions are. That's their interest. But is that interest aligned with the interest of the society, the society at large? Never. Clear? Next. South Asian societies are woven not around the state, but around their plural cultures and plural identities. Should I elaborate this? Do I have to elaborate this? The idea of plurality in India, in Indian society. Now do you realize why this result? Why among those subjects with which more than 1000 students appear, it's sociology who gives us around 10% result. It's not because of any one reason, multiplicities of reasons. Today, see, I'm not a believer of uh, taking time. If the topic is over, fine, good enough. What I did, I did two things. Number one, I spread out what sociology is in front of you. And at the same point of time, I was also teaching you some, some aspects of sociology. Why? Because you also need to be comfortable with my way of teaching. Now it's up to you. Do you find my way of teaching comfortable? If so, find them. Right? So this is all about it. Now I'm opening up the platform. Any doubt, any question, do ask me. Anything, any problem at all. Absolutely. That's why I said, ki, in the class, I'm going, only going to go for the present real-time examples. Right? Exactly. I'm least bothered about the examples given in the books. I am not going to use any book. Yes, uh, at times I'll be using some materials from IGNU. Let's come to the point of books and other things which I'm going to use. Well, no, I'm not going to suggest you any book. Whenever a topic is to be taken up, what I'll do, at first I'll share the respective PDFs of that particular topic from IGNU and from NCRT. Right? Okay, okay go through this, these particular PDFs. And then in the class, we'll start discussing them. And I'll be giving you running notes simultaneously. Uh, I'll be giving you notes in three ways. Some notes will come in the form of hand, handouts. Right? So on some topics, I'll be dictating. 
and at the same point of time there would be these igno materials so if you're planning to buy books and all uh, i'm not the right person to talk to why no book is written keeping your requirement into mind those books are written keeping the academic requirements in mind the requirement of academics and the requirement of upsc they are grossly different they are not the same right number of people will tell you that for thinkers go for george ridzer right right now i didn't bring the book what i'll do uh, whenever i'll go home and i'll come from my home i'll bring th three books for you three books on thinkers for you george ridzer louis ecosia louis ecosia and abraham okay and i'll make you go through all the three books i'll give you those books you go through them before that we'll finish up the thinkers and then i'll give you the books you go through them see how they are written in the books because in the books they have dealt with the thinkers from the point of view of academics but our requirement is different then how can i look at the books and get any help from there not possible practically so this is the reason you have you are already spending a good amount of money by paying the fees here now save some money of your father right those among you who are paying the fees from your own pocket save some money of your own clear and rather let's use the free materials materials which are freely available with me i'll just share them okay so that's how i'm going to approach that's why i said ki no no examples from the books anything else yeah mm -hmm. see mm -hmm. I am not the right person to talk about comment on this man. That's their point. What I did, I showed you the topics and I discussed them from the point of view of sociology. Fine. see again 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 i would genuinely be having a bias towards sociology that's why i am trying to avoid this question let me be very honest because the moment i'll start talking about any other subject i may not be fully objective towards those those subjects right i am not ready to comment anything good or bad about any other subject that's why i'm saying ki i'm not the right person to ask about geography or political science or any other option i can only talk about sociology i can only tell you ki okay with sociology and i can show those things to you right i can say ki yes with sociology every year you will be having at least two two topics from both the sections unless and until you are very unlucky you will be having only one topic or else you'll be having both the topics that i can see but as for political science or for geography as they're concerned i'm not the right one to say even one word right what you should do you should ask you should take the question papers take it to the faculty and ask them okay show us the topics those the topics which you claim that anyone with the with a geographical background can answer this topic or with political science background can answer these topics and how are we supposed to discuss these topics i can tell you about sociology that how with sociology we can handle these topics right because be let's be honest 
the other faculties are also my colleague right point number 1 so we are jhagda mat karwao no i am not the right person why because of value again value is good value is bad as well right that's why, that's why i i avoided this question i i can't i'm i'm not the right one to talk about this there would be a number of things on which it's better to refrain in sociology again and again we we do this uh i talked about that topic na fact value and objectivity when we try to be objective towards something what we do say i know i'm i cannot be i, I have values i have my own values which can corrupt my studies right i am an indian being an indian some of the values have been inculcated in me from the very childhood very early days of my life so the moment i'll be looking at those aspects i'll feel ki uh, this is not right say for example taking care of old age parents right in the west what do i see whenever a child grows up right the parents only push the child out ki you go out you handle your life according to your own ability the parents only push the child out ki you go out okay and then when the parents they grow old who takes care of them the state takes care of them not the children there in the west a son paying a bill for the mother is a very big thing clear so the mother wants to buy something and the and the son or the daughter paid the bill it's a very big thing why because that's his or her hard earned money the son or the daughter's hard earned money why should they waste it for the mother in our society these are so normal right so if i look at those aspects from my point of view what happens my values would cloud my judgment so how can i be objective number 1 i need to understand my society is separate my values are separate that society is separate their values are separate so i should go talk to them try and understand their point of view their perspective that why are they doing this why are they behaving like that that's how objectivity is gained clear or else if i try to judge those things please be careful we are no one to judge again a sociological value if someone is doing something there has to be some reason behind it right and i'm talking all these things with respect to your question we actually practice this we in sociology actually practice this right so the moment i realize that i may not remain value neutral i may not remain objective i requested you ki this is not the right question for me i i prefer not to compare with other subjects Oh, yeah in the syllabus we have comparison comparison between sociology and other social sciences you can look at the syllabus paper uh, topic number 1 you will find that topic comparison between sociology and other social sciences there will be comparing but not with respect to optional subjects clear yeah. chalo yeah. kya paper 1 some topics are overlapping in the paper like the friendship and yeah so the way of answer writing is different for paper 1 and paper even while this is the beauty of sociology what she asked another reason why sociology has such a high selection rate the syllabus is really small they are not two separate papers they are actually one paper when i talk about sociology the subject sociology the subject was not structured based on requirement of upsc so what upsc has done it has forcefully divided the topics what upsc has done they have put the principles in paper 1 and their application in paper 2 now when i'm writing the answers of paper 1 i need the examples from paper 
without the examples from paper 2 how can i substantiate my answers in paper 1 how can i justify my answers on the other hand when i'm writing the answers of paper 2 am i just going to put the examples i have to discuss the philosophies the principles as well so here in the class what we'll do we'll club those topics we'll club them back so no they are not separate topics they are the same topics absolutely we have to because the examples are there in paper paper 2 and the principles are here in paper 1 the same thing just look at them do the comparative analysis family marriage kinship religion politics and society right social stratification paper 2 is completely based on social stratification village society urban society middle class jati caste whatever whatever you may talk about it's all about social stratification at the same point of time social change right social change is there in the last topic of paper one topic number 10 of paper one look at challenges to social transformation in paper two look at uh, so many so many topics are there with respect to social change in paper two Clear? So that's how the topics are. They are not separate topics. This is another advantage of sociology. The syllabus is really small, which can be handled in three months. See, on it, generally speaking, faculties, what they do, they handle sociology in 180 hours. I would be taking a bit more. I might require 200 to 210 hours. 210 hours. Why? Because I'll also be making you write here. It's not just about studying. Studying is not enough. Right? Answer writing is a skill which we need to develop. Guys, now let me be very crude and very straightforward. When you go forward with sociology, especially if you're studying with me, on the day of the examination, it's not just you who would be appearing in the examination. Through you, I will be appearing in the examination. Let me be very honest here. And I am not ready to appear with half-hearted preparation. So I'll ensure that you get prepared here in the class. Right? So yes, I am going to make your life a little bit hell. With respect to writing. Okay. Sure. <laughs> See, let me talk about myself. Let me talk about myself. I originally don't come from sociological background. I did my master's in sociology later on. Okay, now whatever, uh, after that, whatever I did, I did. Uh, but my graduation is in commerce, accounts. Okay. When I appeared in UPSC, I was still not having that master's degree. I was uh, appearing and simultaneously I was uh, preparing for, for I was uh, giving my exam and I was doing the master's. So, my score was, the score that I got in two separate mains, 334, 343. 334 and 343 out of 600. In two separate mains. So if I could get that, there is no reason for you not to get 300 plus out of 500. That's sociology. I don't have to use anyone else's example. I'm using my own example. Three hundred out of five hundred, and you're calling that subject difficult. How much do you want? Four hundred. Why? Out of three hundred, if I could get three forty-three, I'm expecting you to get three hundred out of five hundred. Is that so difficult?
it normally remains around 270, 280, 290. But possible to score 300 plus. Very much possible. The only thing is, you need to be systematic. And you have to invest in writing. You have to invest your time in writing. Investments, invest your time in writing. Possible. Now, do you want me to do the exact calculation? The whole Indian society section, man. How much questions are asked from Indian society? Four to five. I'm taking four. Chalo. Two fifteen markers, two ten markers. Fifty marks out of two fifty. Plus, I'm also looking at land reforms in paper two. Right? Not world history. Nah, nah, nah. Uh, let's avoid world history. Though, yes, we will be studying up a little bit of world history here. Uh, with respect to emergence of sociology, but still I'm avoiding world history, chalo. I'm not getting into world history. Um, let, let's reduce, let's be skeptic, let's, let's reduce. Okay, let's be conservative. Let's do it that way. From land reforms, at least one question in paper two of 15 marks, once again. And then the moment I'm getting into paper three, right, so many aspects overlap. There, once again, I'm looking at 30 to 40 marks. So now tell me. And this is being conservative. You can easily understand I, I started cutting off number of areas. You will, let's not consider those areas as part of sociology. Though we'll have to study them. The point is not how much percentage of marks sociology can provide you in GS. The point is whether sociology is providing you with the basis to understand those topics or not. Clear? Yeah. So this is it. Even I didn't discuss here, if I talk about ethics integrity aptitude, half of the paper. Two subjects actually cre actually constitute that paper, philosophy and sociology. But let's not get into that. That's why I said, okay, let's be conservative. Clear? Anything else? Paper one and paper two. There would be, there have to be. How much new questions can UPSC frame? Do you think UPSC, the, the question framers of UPSC, they're coming from Mars or Venus? There are people among us only, man. Right? But those are added things. Don't go by those things. Those are additional advantages. That's why I didn't discuss those things. And those are very crude things. That's why I didn't discuss them directly in the class. But yes, those advantages are always there. Right? Please, question framers for you can't be, can't be brought from Mars or Venus, right? They have to be from among us only. So how much new concept can they bring in? At least 80% of the questions would be repetitions. 20% can be new. And those 20% would be based on current affairs, the dynamic part. Clear? That's it. Yeah. Well, there I, I would say, identify first and foremost, that's exactly the approach that I'm going to do here in the class as well. First, take that syllabus, merge it back. We are going to start the class from day after tomorrow. Tomorrow you won't be having any class. We are starting from Wednesday, right? 
what I'll do, I'll march back all the topics. And I'll create a syllabus of my own. That's the first step. Number two, second step. Whenever I'm taking up a topic, first I'll be taking up those NCRT books. If, you, if someone is going for self-study, that's in that respect I'm saying, because your question is with respect to self-study. That's why I'm saying this. For self-study, because you're not getting the help of the teacher. What is my role here? My role here is to simplify things for you, not to make the things more complicated. Clear? Here in the class, what I'll do, whenever I'm taking up any topic, I'll first simplify that topic, and then obviously if, if any technical words and other things are to be used, I'll, uh, under, I'll explain those technical words, and then I'll show you how to use those technical things. Right. But if someone is going for self-study, since they won't be having that advantage, there I would say take up NCRT first, those, those respective chapters of NCRT from those topics. Go through them first. First, develop a basic understanding. Then take up the respective NCRT sections, NCRT chapters. Oh, sorry, IGNU chapters. After NCRT, next IGNU. Right. Problem is, number of areas are there, uh, especially with thinkers and others, where we do not have, even today, we do not have proper materials. Right. That's the reason, paper one, paper two, both. That's the reason why people, they rush for the notes of so many faculties, na? notes of this particular faculty, notes of that particular faculty. People just rush for them, start buying them. Don't do that. Without the understanding of that faculty, the understanding that the faculty gives in the class, without that understanding of the fac faculty, those notes are useless. The faculty must have had discussed lots of things and then dictated some of them. You're only getting some of those things in the written format. What he or she discussed, you're not getting it. So this gap will remain there. Right? And intentionally, you can easily understand we faculties why we do not try to fill up that gap. There's a monetary aspect also involved. Here. But yes, it's possible to, to do self-study, but these are the areas where you'll be facing difficulty. Because let me be very honest here. Don't think someone with sociology background would be doing better. No. The person with, a so with sociology background would be finding it more difficult here. They've approached in a completely different way. They've studied things in a completely different way. You have one thinker called Talcott Parsons, right? Talcott Parsons in a college is taught by four separate faculties from four separate angles. Tell me what the student is understanding. A khichdi. So result, you take the same student of BA Sociology or MA Sociology and put, make the student sit here. The student will be finding it difficult. So my request, if anyone here in the class is with sociological background, throw out your understanding out of the class. The way you approached and the way we are going to approach here, they're going to be completely different. This is UPSC. UPSC never wants any one or two individual to have any special advantage. That's the beauty of it. So the approach of UPS is completely different from the academic approach. Clear? So don't think that anyone with sociology background would be doing better. Maybe we would not be able to cope up with them. They are standing at the same situation where you are standing. No, it's not because of scaling. It's because of understanding. Understanding the things from a different perspective, from a different point of view. Our academics, even today, is book-oriented, bookish. This whole thing is application-oriented. That's what UPS's nature is. Simple thing. One particular guy called Karl Marx, 
is there in your syllabus? Talmas died in 1883. If you go and dig his grave, you won't even find his bones. Right? UPS's point of view is, why are we studying Karl Marx even today? No academic will discuss this. But this is UPSC. But what's his relevance? Why are we talking about Karl Marx even today in 2023 in India? That guy was born in Germany, then thrown out of Germany, went to France, uh, even thrown out of France, went to England, was living in a slum in England, died there, buried in a cemetery in, in London. And we in India in 2023, we are studying that guy who died in 1883. What nonsense is that? This is UPSC. Do you understand the difference? That's where the academic people, they find it difficult. Now your question. You want to study, want to know something which we'll learn through three, four months duration in one session. Ah, sorry, that's exactly the wrong understanding. And this is what I was discussing just a while back. People Treat paper one and paper two separately. Just a while back, problem here, please listen to me carefully, guys. You're not listening to me carefully. This question is a typical example of that. Topics may have had been divided into paper one and paper two. Right? In paper one, we have the theoretical perspective. In paper two, we have the practical orientations, practical applications. But if I have to write answers of paper one, I have to justify those things using the examples. Without examples, how can I justify them? So I'm taking things from paper two into paper one. Similarly, when I'm writing the answers of paper two, right? Say UPSC asked a question and I'm just putting in the facts. Is that an answer? That's nothing. I have to put in the theoretical part as well. So the same thinkers of paper one should also be used in paper two, please. They have to be. And I have already answered this. It has to be done. It has to be done. Because sociology is not divided into paper one and paper two. UPC is divided into paper one and paper two. Sociology is one subject, man. Clear? Anything else? Any other question? No? Chalo. Then let's wrap it up, right? Uh, those among you who are, who are going to join Sociology Optional with us, we are going to start the session from day after tomorrow, Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you, class.